Hey there, this is Dan, the producer for Mark and Carrie. If you like this show, we highly recommend you check out Watson's other podcast, Trending Globally. You'll hear more in-depth conversations about politics and policy from some of the world's leading experts, including, occasionally, Mark and Carrie. You can find us by subscribing to Trending Globally on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, that's Trending Globally. All right, on with the show. Thanks. Hello, and welcome to Mark and Carrie. This is a special back to school edition, but then also very even more special because we're in the same place and I'm in the inner sanctum of your of your basement. She has descended to the inner sanctum of the basement. If you're watching this on YouTube and we manage to actually get a video out for once, then you will see that we're actually live coming to you from the basement, <laughs> which is a bit weird, but nonetheless fun. Yeah. So yeah, we'll do it. The reason we're doing this is because it's my birthday today. Yes, it's true. Happy birthday. I don't look at a day over 79 and that's good. <laughs> And uh, we just decided that like she should do come over and we'll do it from here and then afterwards we'll have dinner and it'll be fun. Yeah. So that's that. So yeah, anyway, you're all invited. You're all part of it. So that's great. So let's start off with, uh, I suppose, top of the news was the end of an era, Karen. Well, hang on one sec. I want to make sure that I wish you happy birthday. Okay. And um, and especially to be down. Oh, the guitars are real too. It's not just... It's not, not just, just carbon like, quality. Yeah, they're not just yeah. faking it. Sure. Um, Okay, so yes, getting into things. So yes, the end of an era. So Queen Elizabeth died two weeks ago, I think it was. It was, yes. What was he... Actually, it feels like about 10 years ago, given yes. the mourning people yeah, period, I, I should say. That was say. a long, long I mean, that, 10 that days. Whole, that whole British thing with like yeah. the, the Uber mourning. You know what the BBC was called at one point? No. Mourn Hub. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. That's uh, quite appropriate. Yeah, and now we have King Charles. The third. The third. It just it doesn't sound right, does it? Well, the second didn't things didn't go so well. No, for him, right? th- th- that that whole line hasn't done too well, actually. No. What as a subject of the Queen? Yes. What was your reaction? Oh, uh, what it always is, which is essentially, um, I I don't know if I really want to say this on the podcast, but I'm going to say it anyway. Okay. Um, elderly German uh, who's <laughs> been living, elderly German immigrant of descendants of. No, let's do it again. Descendants of German immigrants who's lived on welfare her whole life dies in government housing surrounded by family who's also on welfare. Yeah, yeah. So pretty Republican sentiment from me in this one. Uh, Yeah, I mean, you can go through the whole thing about, you know, the tourism and having a head of state and it's like a force for balance or whatever. I think all of that just completely evacuates when you realise the last person that she met outside the family was Liz Truss and she died. (laughs) I know, what does this say? You start off with Churchill and you end up with Truss. I mean, talk about the decline of an empire. (laughs) I have, I mean, a couple reactions just uh, from what you just said. And that is... I mean, of course, the talk, and I don't, I'm, I'll just go totally cynical, which is to say, you know, does Charles, is, is he able to keep enough energy in this thing to, uh, to have it keep going? But you really, I mean, that mourning period, you really, again, the cynicism is they had to do this to maintain their power and importance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's fascinating from a kind of social science point yeah. of view, right? I remember when the Queen Mum died and uh, Tony Blair was Prime Minister and he tried to position himself at the front of all this stuff because, you know, it'd be good for him to do right. it. And all of these people came out of the woodwork, like the master of the roads and Black Rod and all these people who yeah. dress up like 18th century right. privateers, right? And they suddenly appeared like, no, no, this is ours. We got this. And it was like the whole sort of hidden side of the British establishment, yeah. the, the real power of the British state comes on view. And they sort of like perform their function in yes. frilly costumes and then disappear again. And you're like, that was weird. Where did they go? But the, the performativity of it, yes. And then I didn't know that there's no inheritance tax yeah. for the royal family. So all, I mean, like all the land, all that stuff, man, talk about welfare. That's oh, yeah, my nice God, deal. absolutely. I mean, they, you know, they reckon that Charles is worth a billion. Yes. And he's never worked a day in his life. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite amazing when you think about that. Well, and then all the stuff that William, or as somebody said, I heard Billy and Kate from the suburbs. <laughs> Billy and Kate, uh, um, they They inherit all of the stuff with their new titles. And, of yes. course, tax-free as well. So of that's course. quite it quite a cushy deal this is very good for the stability of the nation very important yes absolutely but i thought it was interesting commentary that there are more countries from the commonwealth that now with the death 
of oh, yeah. the queen are like, no, thank you anymore. Yeah, you don't want any Charles visits. No. That just, that's just yeah. not happening. It's, yeah. it's a very different vibe to the whole thing, definitely. I mean, so will the sunset, of course, on the British? I mean, is this like, is this the end? Or at least like, you know, no longer punching above their weight class for the um, for Great Britain, the UK, United Kingdom. So there was an interesting piece uh, by uh, a guy called uh, Ganesh, who's an FT writer. And uh, he said, what's, you know, what's happened here with the, the sort of the, the death of the monarch and also the sinking of the pound <laughs> simultaneously and the election of Truss and the lunatic sort of tax giveaways to like the people who already have everything is that it's kind of exposed something that like Britain's not America. Yeah. Right. We know this. Right. The pound is not the global reserve asset. Yeah, we yeah. know that. But amongst the insiders of the British elite who all attended Oxford, Cambridge and or American universities, mm-hmm who basically are here all the time and are part of this global power, like, they actually think they're actually much more powerful than they are. Yes. And yeah. then there's this moment where it's like, okay, Queenie's gone, we don't care anymore, and you have this tin pot little currency that's been overvalued for a generation, and now you're behaving like idiots in your government, and you've basically elected people that clearly have no idea what they're doing. So we're just going to short the hell out of it, and that's what's been going on. Yeah. Well, and thinking about the international relations, foreign policy side of that, well, I mean, they've always had a seat at the table, and the you know, should they... Re- remain at the table given they're not even part of the EU anymore. Well, that's it. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the amount of self-harm that they've done over the past sort of, you know, 10 years or so. Yeah. I mean, Brexit could have been something if you'd actually had a plan and decided yeah. to do real public investment. But what you've got now is the kind of like weird libertarian wing of the Tories that we didn't really know was there. Uh, apparently, they've all been in contact with all the same libertarian funders <laughs> and everything over here that do so well in our politics that you know so well. And uh, yeah, so then it's just like tax cuts for the rich and we'll burn the house down on the way out. And the markets responded predictably. Well, speaking of markets, I mean, I felt bad for Liz Trust for a second. Is it one point one pound or one point two pound to the dollar? I mean, it's almost even. Yeah, no, it went down to one hundred three in overnight oh trading a couple of nights ago and stabilized around one hundred six, one hundred seven. Did you buy something? Did you buy no, like not house? yet. I'm just okay. waiting. It's going to go through parity because okay. it's not going to get any better. I mean, that's yeah. the thing about it. Once you've decided that I'm going to cap fuel bills, which is a reasonably sensible thing to do, yeah. but you're not going to raise any finances for it because whilst Jesus may be Lord, profits are <laughs> sacred. So you can't actually go after all the energy companies, which is what everybody else in Europe is doing, right? So you're borrowing against the future from an already high debt level when the economy is cratering and has inflation. So anybody holding pounds is like, I think I'd rather hold dollars. So you start getting out of pounds. The exchange rate goes down. So Mm -hmm. the the stuff you need to import, which is two thirds of your food in the British case, starts to go up. So people who are already squeezed in this already terribly low wage economy, they're not going to thank her for putting a cap on the bill because the cap's <laughs> far higher than most of them can afford anyway. Yeah. And at the same time, their purchasing power is getting killed as inflation. The Bank of England has to put up interest rates. It just gets worse and worse. It's like the spiral of doom. And it didn't have to be that way. But Trust came in with her new uh, chancellor and just decided, I wonder how much damage we could do in one policy announcement. And they went for it. I mean, in a very short amount of time as well. Oh, yeah. And it's been great. The British press, there's a kind of... I discovered this when I got jumped in the press a couple of... Oh, yes, yeah, last time There's talk. this kind of like, you know, the, there's the Telegraph and the Times and all that. Yeah. And now, basically, what they're doing is they're blaming the left and woke capitalists for shorting the pound. And it's like, nobody's buying this. Everyone knows a moronic set of yeah. policies when they've seen one. And that's what you've done. What's the cadence for calling an election? So they did the Fixed Terms Parliament Act, which was something that Labour brought in, and I'm pretty sure that they got rid of it. So now I think it's at their discretion, but more or less five years. Oh, okay. So she could, I mean, so this is... Oh, she could do it tomorrow, right? She could totally do it tomorrow. I mean, there's only, I think there's really only two ways of thinking about what's going on in Britain just now. One, they realise they've been in for 12 years, right? You can keep switching the government, but we know it's the same people, right? And in 2010, Cameron and Osborne came in and used the crisis then as an excuse to slash the British welfare Mm -hmm. state literally the mm-hmm. vote. It has basically amongst all of the rich countries the worst poorest welfare state with the worst replacement rates and the worst terms and conditions and nobody wants to be on it. They still tell the story nonetheless of strivers and skivers and all these people living on benefits. If there's anybody still living on benefits it's surprising they're barely alive <laughs> yeah. given the fact that like the real welfare state now is payday loans and soup kitchens and I mean, you know so, yeah. food banks right. So anyway you know that this is that this is the first self-harm. Then you do Brexit which destroys the Iraq 
access to the export markets that you need to grow out of this stuff in the name of free trade and exports. And now you're going to do tax cuts with what over 90% of it is going to go to people who already have more money than they right. can spend. Right. So it does no fiscal good whatsoever. It just does a huge amount of damage. So conclusion number one, they know they're out. And they're just basically burning the house down on the way out so that when Labour comes in, they're going to have a hell of a job repairing yeah. it, right? Or number two, even more terrifying, they actually believe this stuff. Right, and it's not a scorcher policy. No, I mean, it's actually, actually... No, no, I really think yeah. this is going to help. Yeah. It's a bit like finding a nail in your foot and then deciding to remove your leg at the hip. Um, great analogy or met metaphor. Um, speaking of nail on the foot, I have some good news for you from the other side of the Atlantic. Oh, what's that's that? here in America. Well, there's only 768 days until the presidential election of 2024. Oh, God. So you can, <laughs> you can look forward to that. Um, and I think it's 40, 40 days until the midterms. Um, and of course, so it's, we're past Labor Day, so it's midterm hysteria. Mm -hmm. And um, I like to, you know, you it, when you read or you listen to Democrats, they're like, it's not, I mean, look at Kansas, look at the special election in upstate New York. It's going to, we're not going to totally be shellacked in this election. <laughs> but I mean, it's still going to be a tough road to hoe. I mean, President Biden, I think, is now at 42, but he was at 36 at the end of July approval. Right. So it, it, that is. Uh, Which, in, in comparison to President presidents at this point in the cycle is actually not that bad, right? I mean, he's still, I mean, he's, a, he's now at 20, so that's, that's you right. know, and he's going up at least in, in some polls. So these are all, um, all good signs. I mean, it doesn't look like, I mean, so on the, in the House, the, the Republicans will take the House. It's unclear whether the margin or not will be right. like the 20 or 30 seats. So it may be less than that. Is this because it's strictly because of gerrymandering? Because, like, you know, the unspoken spoken thing yes. here is you have a party that will not disavow a president who is spreading a lie about the election being stolen and they will not contradict him, right? Yeah. Now, you know, in a way, the Democrats, I'm surprised, just aren't coming out and just doing that. Just go for that or not again. It's like, look. They lost and they refused to admit it. it was yeah. Like, why are you playing with these guys? So why are they still going to win? Is it just gerrymandering? Well, yes, I think that's always the tale. And that in 435 seats that are up, there's maybe 20 that are competitive. I mean, this is true. Wow. This is always true. Yeah. And so gerrymandering, of course, is the main engine driving that. But that's the margin right there of what the Democrats have right now. And so, I mean, these close elections are always fought in those. But I think that with the ramped up um, active state legislatures, there's, you know, that 20 then shrinks to 10 or something. Right. So then we're relying on special elections and it's just such a bad, bad system. So essentially what you're saying is the best the Democrats can hope for is to lose the ability to pass any legislation for the next two years, but not to be completely shellacked. Yes. And, well, and not to have the margin so much so that that the Republicans have this full mandate. I mean, they'll think they have a mandate anyway yeah, right. to totally go to subpoenaville with Biden. And I mean, they'll probably still do that, but at least it it will it will force, for example, Kevin McCarthy, who's promised like you know a hundred uh, seat margin may not be speaker. So maybe there'll be somebody less in Trump's right, back pocket. Right, right. I mean, maybe, maybe not. The Senate is where I think things are interesting, which is that I mean, it looks more like more possible that the Democrats might hold the Senate in a 50-50. I mean, there's a lot. Of, they have to keep hanging on to their 14 seats that they have. Mm -hmm. And then, and I mean, so in other math, Republicans have to just gain one seat. But that's been hard because there are all these, there are all these Trump candidates like a Dr. Oz who's like not even there. I mean, he's doing all this weird stuff. I mean, there are all these Trump can't back candidates. You mean there's a nuts. downside to getting people who are a wee bit eccentric to be the face of your party? Just a tiny little bit. Mm. So, um, so in, in, I mean, we'll, you know, as we get closer, I'm sure there'll be a lot more to say about it in, um, in detail. But at least right now, it, it looks like the Democrats might. Right. You know, there's got to be a lot of stuff that, um, that go, the wind has to be at their back. But I think it's at least a possibility. So last time, around during the presidential a lot rested on georgia yeah right yeah, it's all yeah. georgia on my mind right and georgia yeah. is still on your mind isn't yes. it yes i mean it's such a good point i the senate is very possible it comes down to two black men Raphael warnock who's current but is finishing out a term and then herschel walker who's the beloved football star and they were they're set up to have a debate and herschel walker did this really incredible thing to set expectations of 
he he's just a country boy. He's not as smart as the Reverend, but he's gonna try hard in the debate. Wow. So like if he can't name all of his kids' names, I mean that's not on him. He's just trying as hard as he can. So um, yeah. well then again, Boris Johnson can't mention name all his kids' names either. <laughs> and he had a first class classical education, so I wouldn't hold that against anyone. To be fair enough. Good point. That's it. Um, so we'll see what happens in that particular debate. But I just the I just love the setting of low expectations. So if you just yeah. show up and you like can put some words together. That's it. And then just say, away. I'm a football star, he's not, so yes. therefore vote for me. Yes. Right. Yep. Well and also this elitism too, right? He's the educated reverend. Yes. Which is then interesting just thinking about po- black politics, black politics in yes. Georgia and just the that tension that exists. I wonder if that's a generational shift in the sense that sort of, you know, the hold of black institutions like the church is yeah. the center of the community. Etc. It's just becoming, you know, fractionalized as like the people who are the center of that community get older yeah. and pass. And what you then have is a much more, in a way, representative like right. America fractured right. African American community. They're, like they're almost as isolated as everybody else now, right? Yeah. And that leads to people like Carl Walker being able to pull those votes away. Right. And like and to be able to take advantage of the superstardom that became part yeah, of Yeah, being a superstar really yeah. helps. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Being um, yeah, yeah, I remember thinking it was, you know, I think it was, you know, if you say that the first Trumpist candidate really was, uh, what's her name, from um, uh, from Alaska? Oh, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin, right. That, you know, it used to be the case that you were a politician, you went on to become a celebrity. But now yeah. what you do is you're a celebrity and then you can become a politician. Right. I mean, it's not, I, I was listening to something that said, it's not always true that the sports superstar wins like Richard Petty, the race yeah. car driver. I mean, so there certainly are cases, but I mean, he's pulling in a ton of money. So just on that like it just puts you so far ahead yeah exactly you know if you're some you know uh some no name georgia on my mind yeah well it's not the only place that's getting elections is it well this was interesting so i um you know so thinking about america didn't realize that there was an italian election coming up and then you have a far-right candidate win georgia who i kept hearing was the first candidate since the Mussolini. You mean Italy rather than Georgia? Georgia. Did I say Georgia? Georgia. I meant Italy. Yeah. I- Italy. 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 Yes. Not Georgia. Um, yeah, first far right since Mussolini, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder, I mean, does she like that comparison? <laughs> but anyway. So here's an interesting one. Um, the, the, there's two two things that are of interest. Nobody really just decided to vote for her. What's happened is the collapse of the centre-left's vote. Yeah. A lot of sort of like angry working class people, which is very common in populism. Yep. If I think that the left has deserted me and my class, I'll just vote for the, you know, if you will, the, the working class right, if you want to yep. put it that way. Um, so there was that one. Then there was the awful performance of Salvini, the Lega, the other mm-hmm. party in Italy that's on the right, because there's this coalition of the right. So it's really kind of weird. So you think the first kind of populist right there was Berlusconi, mm-hmm. Forza Italia. Yep. So he's still there, which is amazing. The man must be filled with like basically piss vinegar and formaldehyde. I mean, Botox, you know, there's nothing yep. else holding them together, yep. right? <laughs> so he's the kind of, he thought he'd be the kingmaker. And it was going to be the Liga and, and then Maloney be the junior partner. And then it all got shook up. He got nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liga did terrible and all the votes went to her. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, they've been playing sotto voce to show my Italian off. <laughs> uh, they've been playing soft voice and all the rest of it. We're not really fascists, etc. Um, one of my graduate students, uh, Josh, sent me this video. 2019 Maloney at the World Family Congress, which oh. is one of these places where, like, we can't say Grand Fascist Congress, so we'll just call it family, yeah, right? right? So they're all there, and it's this speech that she gave, and, you know, it's a very rousing speech. But if you're looking at it, you can see it on YouTube, the, the, the translation of it. She manages to drop these key phrases into it. It's brilliant. So the first one is all about why do they hate the family? Why do they hate us? Why do they fear us? Because we're proud of our nation, etc. Mm-hmm. We're proud of who we are. We are individuals. We're not, number one, we're not just faceless consumers Mm. The way that the, what did you call them now? The, the global financial speculators want us to be. Mm. Right, well, come on. That is literally protocols of the elders of Zion. You might as well just say the Jews, right? That, wow. that was okay. straight there, right? Yeah. So there's all these references to financial speculators, right? And that's code for Jews, right? Okay. Okay. And the second one is halfway through the speech, why do they hate us, etc.? Because of what we admire and what we, what we care about. We care about God, family, country. That was the three words that Franco used oh, to start Lord. the civil war. And I was like... Way to go. Whoa. I mean, I want to watch it again and see if she's got any, or maybe she's got your know, Hitler line in there or something. Yeah. But like, I mean, it's just like fascist greatest hits. And I'm like, right. really? I mean, come on, let's let's look at this for what it is, please. Well, and I did hear an interview with a couple of voters that said they voted for her because she puts Italians first and mm-hmm. they feel like they haven't been part of, they haven't right. been prioritized. And this, this is part of the sort of the downside of, you know, being in the EU, right? 
that you don't have fiscal policy that's meaningful. Yeah. You don't have monetary autonomy, right? So your government basically takes orders to a large extent yeah. from what the policy elites in Brussels say. Why? Because you've got a huge amount of debt and if it wasn't for the ECB effectively, you yeah. know, backing up your bond market, they'd go through the roof and you'd be bankrupt and you'd be Greece. So yeah. you don't really have that much autonomy. And after a while, you know, when you've been running a budget surplus for 20 years and your economy shrunk by 20% in real terms, yeah, people are pissed. Yeah. I get it. I was thinking about her in relation to the Amer- another woman who's elected head of their country. And of course, the United States were still not there. And I was thinking, it, the first woman president's going to be a Republican. She'll come from the right, I mean, you, as sort of a similar model yeah. and come from the right because it's not going to be, it just, you can't see it, especially just the, seeing where female leaders come in terms of yeah. party come from. It won't be somebody from the left. It'll no, that's right. right. It's right. always yeah. from the right. I mean, yeah. you know, Mrs. Thatcher was a trailblazer there, but she wasn't the only one. Right. I mean, in fairness, in Europe now, I mean, you've got Sanna Marin in Finland and yes, you have Mette in, in Denmark and, you know, they're all center lefties. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's maybe something about Anglo countries can only bring a woman from the right. Who knows? And then, of course, we've got Brazil. Yes. Well, I mean, I was, I have read a, t- a little bit about this, but not realizing that it's actually on, coming up. And yeah. Not, so you've got a guy about. that they jailed on a dubious <laughs> corruption conviction. Classic. Not because he might not have been slightly corrupt or whatever, but because, come on, the entire country was run that way. And so they finally quashed this in the Supreme Court. He gets out. He brings the band back together again. He's bringing yeah. Bolsonaro. And Bolsonaro, who's basically the representative of, like, the worst type of kind of put aristocratic farming and other yeah. interests who are burning down the Amazon to provide <laughs> so we can have more chicken uh, or at least soy. Uh, that's that's what's on the table. And Bolsonaro apparently has already pulled the Trump and said, if I lose, it must be fraud. Yeah. So, it's a smart so that's play. not going to be, that's not going to end well. It's a smart, I mean, I mean, you just can't see that. I mean, it's such an effective line. Because, and I think we're going to hear that in the, coming out of the American midterms too. Mm. Like people, I mean, the governor, one of the gubernatorial candidates in Arizona, Carrie Lake, she's already started sort of setting this up as it's going to, you know, fraud. Um, Why can't people accept that they lose these days? Is this the, okay, this is the thing. There's this critique that Europeans have had about American parenting, which they then adopted. Because what always happens is we tell everyone in America they're wrong and then we do it, right? So it went like this. What is it with you people and everybody in school getting a medal? Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. do you mean everybody wins? Somebody has to lose for somebody to win, right? And that's that's a 30 year old critique, right? So anyway, that's there. And then maybe you bring all these people up and they've never actually lost. So when they run for an election, it's just too much trauma and they can't handle it. I mean, I actually have wondered the same thing just in relation to everyone gets a trophy. <laughs> well, your mind works the same it, way. It, How everyone gets a trophy. But I've also thought that, I mean, maybe it's just much more about money and power, meaning that you make a name for yourself and then you get to go and Dancing with the Stars. Oh, or, that's the celebrity right, to the power right. angle, yeah. Or you get the Fox, you know, the Fox commentary deal or the right. MSNBC commentary deal. So you, in order to stand out, right, you have to be even more and more extreme. Oh, that's a really yeah. interesting. So think about that's it this way then, right? So let, let's let's think of it statistically, right? So imagine sort of golden age, quote unquote, politics, right? It's kind of quasi-normal distribution. Everybody's in the middle trying yeah. to basically get yeah. the votes, right? And then you figure out, now I'm just going to go with the tails. Yeah. And I'm going to gerrymander and all I need to do is capture these guys it's mm-hmm. fine and then that only works if you keep throwing red meat or blue yes. meat to the base right yep. and then let's take them out as like the tails of the distribution and then let's kind of normalize those tails you have to keep getting more extreme to get yep. any attention yeah yeah mm, but the normalizing the tails is crucial because that's what I mean the people that Trump endorsed are the tails right and they won so now and it's they're, like they're that's, not, that's how, yeah. how you've shifted it out all yeah. the time absolutely yeah um Okay, talk about normalizing the tales, I guess. I mean, Ukraine and Russia. So he had the Putin has these fake elections. Yes. He's going to annex these four areas. That was a hell of a segue, by the way. Usually yeah. we take a breath. I know. <laughs> so talk I mean, about normalizing the tales. We have to celebrate tales. your birthday here. So. Well, I know. But anyway, you were saying, no, it's a fair point. I mean, it's about normalization, right? So yeah. what, what is he doing? Well, and I guess, from, again, I look at this from my perspective as uh, as an American just using the the map that he did for Crimea and and what the world especially the US you you yell and scream you're like that's really bad but no one's willing to actually put any muscle behind it because i because you know what the next the next scenario is so it's really like you just have to kind of be quiet and hope that he doesn't do more i it just seems like a strange scenario there's no punishment for him 
But there's a weird sort of echo of this. I mean, it's nowhere near as, as, as blatant or, or as ridiculous, right? But, you know, Bolsonaro saying, I'm not going to, you know, yeah. admit defeat, right? Your, your, your Congress person in, yeah. what is it, Colorado or whatever? Yeah, was Arizona, it? yeah. You know, basically. Oh, yeah. you know, and it's the same sort of, you know, this used to be not just deviant behavior. This was like, you're breaking the rules. And now we basically normalize breaking the rules as being normal. But when you do that, it means kind of there are no rules. Mm -hmm. And that's when it gets really, really dangerous. Yeah. There's no play for the for anti-Russian countries, is there? Except to just... Hope. No, definitely not. I mean, I mean, all right, so think about it this way. There's one way of thinking about this is the tripwire strategy, right? Yeah. So I know that I'm getting my ass kicked on the battlefield. I can throw three million <laughs> people into this and it's not going to make any difference unless you're just thinking about I'm willing to sacrifice an entire generation to grind this down. Yeah. And, and you know, one one way to think about it is it's a it's a it's a it's a. One way to think about this is is a contest, and it's a contest between our ability to resupply Ukraine mm -hmm. and Russia's ability to throw people in the battle, yeah. and which one wears down first. So one of the ways of shortening this is you incorporate these regions into Russia and then say, this is now Russia, so mm -hmm. you're attacking Russia. So mm -hmm. you need to actually stop because this is now an attack on Russia. We're really going to up the ante. And then, okay, what do you do in response to that? And also the, the pipeline. I mean, that's, wow. Yes. That is literally saying, yeah, we're kind of at war with you. We yeah. are. We're not admitting it yet. It is classic hybrid warfare. Yeah. So they deny it. You can't prove it, but it happened. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, they're in really in a tough spot. And then they're going to get through the winter okay because German gas storage is 91%, etc., all that sort of stuff. But it's what happens next year if this is still yeah. going on. And given how much the Ukrainians have been damaged and the sacrifices they've made and how much it's going to cost to rebuild the country... Do they want to quit now? No, yeah. they totally don't. Yeah. So, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to tell them to back off? Well, you know, if you're going to do that, you should have done it six months ago. Right. I did have a moment. I think this week there was a shooting in Russia, right? Uh, yeah. And all of the Russian men that are leaving, and I didn't know how much hype, how much of that was hype, leaving so they're not conscripted into the... Oh, no, that's very real. I mean, that's basically anyone with a car is like, I'm off to Georgia. So so I thought maybe public, public opinion, Russian public opinion is what pulls Putin back because he's like, you know, he can't survive. Like people actually... There's a lot of people out in the provinces and places that you've never heard of who are being put on buses with a lot of physical force. Yeah. And they are going to fill those trenches whether, you know, public opinion likes it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, right. Right, not the people yeah. who are like... Yeah, it's not the Moscow. ones who are... It's, yeah, not, the, it's right. not the NGU students running out of Moscow, right? <laughs> right. And, you know, they, yeah. they, are, they are out there already. Yeah. Finland yeah. just shot its border. Oh, it did? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so the terrible thing is you've got all these people who are like, I really don't want to be part of this. And then they've got nowhere to go. Yeah. So, you know, that doesn't yeah. help. But at the same time, you can understand why. I mean, do you really want to host 200,000 scared, alone, financially done Russian men? Men. Right. Yeah, yeah. Russian yeah. men. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a bit of a problem to say the yeah. least. So anyway, yeah. everything's sounding great, isn't it? <laughs> so happy. I mean, we as started always. off with the, de the end of an yes. era. Yeah. Britain's economic dumpster fire. Uh, the Democrats thinking that not being completely shellacked is like a good day in yes, the office. Yep. Italy being run, if you look between the line, by fascists. Brazil on the edge and now Ukraine in a tripwire yeah. strategy. Yeah. Is there any good news? Well, there is. In a recent interview, President Biden declared that COVID was over. Um, and then very quickly, his uh, press team said that it wasn't over the pandemic. Yeah, and then all the, the stuff, I think it maybe was the pandemic was over, but COVID, it was, it was a lot of like high stepping, dancing around. Well, why, why? See, this is what Democrats do all the time. I don't understand this, right? Republicans would walk up and go, COVID's over. And you would be like, no, it isn't. They'd be like, right. shut up, liberal. Right. That'd be it, right? And the Democrats are like, COVID's over. Maybe it's not. We don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> How about someone in the New York Times? Does the health people think that? That's not the science. Are you wearing your mask? I mean, come uh. on. Well, I heard this really smart take on it, and that is to say that maybe Biden was actually do like standing up and doing a very Republican thing and saying like, "Is it we're no more masks, no more all the the long lines for testing?" Like, yeah, we're moving on. Yeah. And so taking that stronger, showing he has a backbone right. versus. But like, then all don't the engage anybody else who's like taking this, right. down, you know, going right. the other way. Yeah. I was just up at this uh, American political science uh, annual jamboree oh. in uh, in Montreal, yes. and they, I was only still had arrive can. 
Uh-huh. Oh my God. I mean, it was just one of those things where I was like, where's my MAGA hat? I mean, seriously, right? So you have to download the app and upload this and make set for that. All right, fine. Okay, we'll go through it. Then I get into the airport. Yeah. And because I fly a lot, I know how to get out of airports really quick. Yeah. Right? So I got out of the airport within 20 minutes. And I'm in a car. And I'm taking off. And I get the text and it's like, you've been selected for random COVID testing. You need to go to the airport and go. And I'm like, no. So I go and talk to people and there's loads of people at this conference have all had this thing. Yeah. So we all figured out a strategy. And the strategy is we're all leaving on Sunday morning. So we're all going to get tested on Saturday night. Okay. Because by that point, none of the results matter because right. we're all back home. Right, <laughs> right. right. So I, I did that. I, I went to this testing place. It was really yeah. hard to get a testing point. There was loads of people from this conference. We're yeah. all cynically doing this, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the public health aspect, like nobody in the facility is wearing a mask. I yeah. mean, like what level of theatre is this at this yeah. point, right? So, you know, we do the whole thing, blah, blah, blah. And we all go home. And then Canada is basically phoning me all the time in French, yeah. asking me to verify that I've taken a test. And of course, you know, four or five days ago, they're like, you, we don't need to do this anymore. And it's like, yeah, you don't need to do this anymore because it's stupid. Now stop it. So strangely enough, I drove from Michigan back to province, went through Canada. Also, I had to use a rocket, but they didn't even ask for it. at the. So I did all the stuff. And then I was like, but don't you want to see this thing that I worked so hard for? And they're like, like nah, it's you're fine. Good. We you're totally good. don't care. Right? Yeah. So the incentive is less to like actually cooperate. Uh, but good for you and the other political scientists for, you know, figuring out a way to short circuit things. Well, short you know, we're putting people who study institutions and rules and they're, they're great until they affect us and then we cheat. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Thank what you. kind of time? Yeah. Um, and now I'll never be able to go back to Canada having admitted yeah. that publicly. Um, oh, Florida. Man, well, you know Florida. I mean, having traveled there and spend time there. Yes. And I, you, those pictures are really kind of stunning. Oh my, so um, I was talking to a friend who lives in, in Naples. Yeah. And I said, how bad was it? And he said, it was eight foot over the beach. Wow. Five foot through the town. And immediately, I mean, I know this place really well, right? There are multi-million dollar properties yeah. right next to the beach. And I've always said, and they're like, global warming's going to yeah. get this one, right? Well, yeah, because the hurricanes are getting stronger, because yeah. the water is warmer. It's just physics. You might not like it, but it's just physics, right? So these bigger, more powerful, slow-moving storms are coming in. They went basically all the way to what's called Airport Pulling Road, which mm-hmm. is two and a half miles from the beach, at five feet. Wow, geez. So just think Holy every cow. building Mighty. being whacked with that. Yeah. Two mi- the whole city centre is just done, right? Wow. Now, just think about the insurance and rebuilding costs on this. I was just going to ask that. Now, you keep doing this. So here's a weird way of thinking about this, right? All Remember you used to talk about, like, this is a one in a hundred year storm, yeah. right? Well, if you start to get it every two years, it's not one in a hundred years, right? right? And if all your models of payments in and payments out are based upon that kind of like it only happens randomly, but it actually doesn't, it happens very concentratedly and they build on each other, you can't insure it. Yeah, I, that's why I wondered, are those multi, can you get insurance on those multi-million dollar homes? It's a very good question. You're going to be able to get them after this storm, right. probably, but after the next one, right? I don't know. This I really like don't know if you're going to get it. Earthquake insurance in San Francisco. I mean, right. yeah. Um, I, on the politics of this, I was thinking, of course, Ron DeSantis uh, running uh, running for re-election. Is he's, but it's like a very different Ron DeSantis when he's on this stuff, isn't he? He had to be, right? He had to shut down his like nasty stuff of Biden because he had to go ask for federal help. But also he was doing the mature statesman thing. He was doing that this is a terrible storm. Yes. This is something that we need to take very seriously. I want yeah. all Floridians to take it seriously. It's like, where's all your like usual loof, loony, goofy yes. swipes at people you don't like? Yeah. Well, and it's so because running against a well-known for governor charlie christ and so i expected sort of dueling people you know trying to steal the microphone but i had the same impression that he's really was like the statesman sort of thing and especially given you know that he's like donald trump and it's him for 2024 and on and on like it does give you a different look of him and like he's a pretty smart politician in this way and two, not not that i want to say this actually matters or anything but two ivy league degrees i believe it's something I think he's not that, yeah. he's clearly not so no. so this no. is an interesting one then because you know the whole sort of like real republican thing is rhino it's republicans yes. in name only right? and that's the kiss of death yeah so he doesn't say that the election was stolen but he doesn't deny it correct he beats up on lgbtq people he does all the stuff he does which is like this. And he's throwing, you know, he's throwing red meat to the base on this one, yep. right? 
But then he stands up and he can play the statesman. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, which would I hate to quote Eminem, but would the real Ron DeSantis <laughs> please stand up? Well, and a couple of days before, he had sent the immigrants from Venezuela. Oh, that was outrageous. Video. That was kidnapping. But, I mean, to I mean, he got more press than the yeah, yeah, viral totally, break. I totally. mean, it was, it was, so just on the media, like the political chess part of it, you were like, wow, I mean, that's kind of stunning. Not on the ethical and moral side of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, just kind of stunning to see Yeah, he, he, that. Does, he knows how to play stunt play, yes. definitely. Yes, wow. yeah. I and I think this the, um, this question of where Trump is is I, I don't know even, yeah because he's kind of missing in all this isn't he yeah. is, it, is it the legal stuff or what I don't know I mean I think that. I think there's a, so I have a couple of theories. One is that you know he's endorsed all these people, and I don't I don't really believe this, and that he's actually being quiet, waiting to see what uh, what happens. But I just don't know that there's a role for him in this right now. And I do uh, wonder if the legal stuff and the recent the New York Attorney General like you know um, his whole family has been charged. I don't know exactly what the yeah. legal term if that. But he's such a bloviator. You can't imagine that anything would ever make him quiet. But. So it's a kind of a weird one with the whole New York stuff. Not that I've looked deeply into this, yeah. but to the extent that I have, it's kind of weird because if you basically are saying that the whole family engaged in systematic fraud, defrauding financial institutions by overflating assets, it's not Al Capone. That's you know the one that people will yeah. say. Right? It's not tax, tax avoidance. It's RICO. Yeah. It's racketeering, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, they have not hit him with the RICO statute. So what exactly is the charge and why isn't it a RICO if that's what the public thing is? Mm-hmm. So I wonder what's, I wonder if this is the whole thing about there was a, a deal on the table and mm-hmm. he wouldn't go for it and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. So it's really interesting to see how that plays out. But I think your other point's actually even more interesting that he is not a statesman. Yeah. He is a rabble rouser. And in moments like this, he just has no role to play. Right. Yeah, that he's not standing out Mar-a-Lago, outside Mar-a-Lago with like a hard hat or a shovel. Yeah, or right, exactly. Or, or saying, yeah. you know, bringing people in because their houses have been destroyed yeah. or any of that stuff. Yeah, no. That's, yeah, that's not him at all. I wonder how Mar-a-Lago got out. I, I was just I wondering that. I wonder. Yes, Ooh, I was just wondering. That's interesting. Well, you know, I was trying to think of maybe something lighter to talk about, but given the the string of topics that we have, <laughs> this is the only thing I can land on that's potentially lighter, so it really Go shows on. you the state of the world. I've heard really good things about the show Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer. Really? Yes. So you're actually saying our light thing to end on is a show about a murderous serial Correct. killer. Correct. Yes, oh. I've heard it's very compelling. So I've not watched, but I've heard it's very compelling. Mm. And that even if you feel the Who it- plays him? Factor. Um, oh, shoot. Of course, now I'm going to forget. Um, oh shoot, I can't remember. Right. Um, but someone not super famous, right. but um, but enough to kind of yeah, like right, fall right. into the part and disappear. Um, but that yeah, you have the ick of like I don't really want to be mm-hmm. watching, but it pulls you in and uh, you can't stop watching. Right, so um, yeah, so that was my light thing about a about a mass murder. I was just talking yeah. to my uh, nephew Alex there because he's watched a bit more of the Lord of the Rings reboot oh, yeah. thing than I than I have. And he says, I watched episode, I think it was, well, I watched episode three or episode five last night. I was like, oh, how was it? He's staying with us just now. Yeah. So how was it? And he says, there was honestly, there was this one moment where they had like, Gadriel uh, walking on a boat. And it was just this sort of slow-mo of her walking on a boat with like, oh, going on and <laughs> yeah. lights and all that. And it lasted about a minute. And I remember thinking to myself, they really haven't worked out the plot for this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> They're having to take up so They're much just time. like, fill in a minute, fill in right. a minute. We don't know what to do. Longer, longer. Um, well, lovely to be in, in the Yes, in, in the, in the basement, in the yes, cave. Yes, exactly. yes, yes. This is a, quite a delight. So now we're going to go off and drink something, but not too much because I have to go to the gym tomorrow because I'm old and that's my plan on staying alive. So with that, we will love you and leave you. Thank you very much for listening. Happy birthday, Blythe. See you all later.